Hi, Chris Glynn here with the Nightlight Podcast. Simon Bennett is with us on the show today, and we're going to be taking a deep dive into one of the mysteries of the book of Revelation, the six seals in Revelation chapter 6. End time news and views. Simon, welcome back to the show. I know our audience has been blessed by your previous expositions of last day's scripture. And we're looking forward to what you have to share with us today. Sure. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, But just before I start, before going into Revelation, I really want to make a uh, just a little bit of a statement about um, its place in the body of last day scripture. That's good. You know, a lot of people, when you say, well, I'm interested in last day scripture, they immediately talk about Revelation as being the sort of primary source for last day scripture. Personally speaking, I see perhaps Revelation as the, the roof of the house of last day scripture. You know, it's the final thing that goes on the house of last day scripture. But certainly, When you're considering building a house, the first most important thing is to lay a good foundation. Otherwise, the house will not stand. Right. And I do think it's just very important for people to to recognize that Revelation is not the foundation of last day scripture. Right. It's It's the roof on the top. And where do we go for our foundation? Well, I'd like to propose that we do go to the words of Jesus. Um, 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yes. So Christ is the cornerstone of every part of our life. And I believe that his prophetic word, especially in Matthew 24, 25, about 97 verses, lays such a good, solid foundation for understanding about the last days. Um, Matthew 7, 24 says, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And I do believe the words of Jesus do lay a solid foundation. And I just wanted to do just a very quick review of Matthew 24. Just before we get into the seals, it's just helpful having said that. Jesus emphasizes the reliability of his words. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. That's Matthew 24, 35. You can probably divide up Matthew 24 into three sections. Matthew 24, 4 to 13 describes the signs of the times, great deceit, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, a falling away of the faithful and persecution of the saints. So those are the signs of the times. Right. And the next section, which is from verses 14 to 28, describes the the final signs of the times. So verse 14 is the gospel being preached in all the world. Verse 15 is the abomination of desolation in the holy place. And I think it's verse 21 which it, that initiates the time of great tribulation. And then for the rest of the book from verse 29, we read what happens after the tribulation, the return of Christ, the rapture, and Christ's counsel to us referring to that. And it's a fairly sort of simple, straightforward, uh, clear narrative from Christ there that, that I believe is our our foundation for last day scripture, what Derek Prince calls the spine. Once you've got the spine down, you can start adding the other pieces and making sure that you're going to have a good body of scripture, not a not a rather crazy, deformed body. Right. So I just wanted to, to mention that uh, first before we go into Revelation. So I just think it's important that our foundation is in the words of Jesus. And so whenever I hear a doctrine, I do go first to Matthew 24. And I say, well, does that fit in with Matthew 24? Is that reflected in Matthew 24 or not? And it makes life quite simple, really, having such a clear foundation there. Yes, that's right. But we're going to turn to Revelation now, and we're going to see especially, which is nice, that Revelation 6 has many connecting points to Matthew 24, which is nice. And it does. That's what we do when we build last day scripture. We're looking for those key connecting points, rather like putting together a piece of furniture from Ikea. You've got to find where the pieces fit together, and then they'll, they'll make a good, strong piece of furniture. So just in Revelations, in Revelations 4, John is brought to the throne room of God. In Revelations 5, John sees that God has a scroll in his hand, in his right hand with seven seals. And in Revelations 5, a call goes out to see who is worthy to open this scroll. And no one was found until the lamb who had been slain, Christ, steps forward 
And in Revelation 6, Jesus opens the seals of the prophetic scroll. So it's nice to see it um, pictorially. In the old days, the king would send messages on a lengthy scroll. And to make sure it wasn't opened on the way to its destination, he'd have a wax, like a wax seal on it. And you couldn't open the scroll, you couldn't read it until you'd broken that seal. That's right. And so... I'm not sure if these were wax seals on this scroll, but they're seals, and there's seven seals on the scroll of Revelation. And Revelation 6 looks at the first six. So we're just going to look at the first six seals today. Chris, I wonder if you could possibly read then the seals one by one, then you have Revelation 6 in front of you. That would be great. Yes, uh, Revelation 6, 1 and 2. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals... And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So this is the very important rider on the white horse. And traditionally, this has always been understood to represent Christ. And I'll tell you the reasons why. There is another rider on the white horse in in Revelations 19, which is absolutely certainly Christ. Right. Uh, Revelations 19, 11, I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Another piece of evidence is this, the color of the horse is white. And in Revelation, the color white always refers to righteous things, the righteous things of Christ. Uh, Revelations 1, 14, Jesus's hair is white. In Revelations 2, 17, he who overcomes is rewarded with a white stone. Right. In Revelations 3, 4, and 5, he who overcomes is dressed in white. In Revelations 6, 11, this chapter, actually, the martyrs are given white robes while they wait for Christ's return. Yes. Another piece of evidence is the crown. In Greek, the word for his crown is a Stephanos crown, which uh, throughout the New Testament is associated with Christ and his people. Just got some references here. I'll just mention them. Philippians 4.1, 1 Thessalonians 2.19, and 2 Timothy 4.8. But my favorite piece of evidence is this, uh, the, what the word went out conquering and to conquer. So the word conquer, the Greek word, is also translated as overcome. And the Greek word is actually Nike. Really? <laughs> and so actually the Nike brand actually means overcome, which I didn't know. And so a lot of the verses that we find in the Bible about overcoming are the same word that is used in Revelation 6 for conquering and to conquer. So we have 1 John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. That's the word Nike again there. And again, my favorite one, Romans 8, 37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So the word used for conquering is this overcoming word that is just sort of intrinsic in revelations and in in the scripture for uh, the sort of christian overcoming right that uh, how christ overcome on the cross he won the victory on the cross yes and so i really like that that christ overcomes so we've had this gospel period now uh, where the white horse has been overcoming wherever the gospel has been preached it's been winning gaining territory winning souls and christ has been conquering and in the Greek, also just the, the text, because uh, the tense, because it says, and he went forth conquering and to conquer, it's the most continuous expression possible, uh, meaning that the white horse will never stop conquering. Amen. And that sort of fits, I think, of the church age, really, where the church continues and continues and continues to overcome and conquer through the gospel. The rider on the white horse is carrying a bow. There's quite a few uh, references to the, the bow of Jehovah in the Old Testament in Isaiah 50, 28, and Habakkuk 3, 8, and 9, uh, Lamentations 2 and 4. It's meant to signify the doctrine of truth from which the arrows, <laughs> which denote the doctrinal things from which and with which those, we have our sort of spiritual, the spiritual weapon is those arrows that come from the bow, doctrine of truth. So I think all those points makes fairly overwhelming evidence that this is Jesus and the gospel. Absolutely. Conquered on the cross 
and the church has continued to conquer, has been more than conquerors, through even through great persecutions and sufferings. Yes. And uh, it's a new doctrine, really, that this could represent the Antichrist, but I don't see any evidence actually in the piece for that. Right, I agree. And Simon, it makes no sense that at the climax of the great throne scene of Revelations chapter 5 and 6, when the Lamb, Jesus, is the only one found worthy to open the seals on the scroll, that when he opens the first seal, the first thing that happens is that the Antichrist rides out. I mean, that's unthinkable. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that the rider on the white horse is Jesus. Yeah, I think it's I think it's beautiful. I think it just shows that in, in, in God's sight the overwhelming primary theme of, of the last days, which it actually has been the entire two thousand year period, has been the gospel. Yes. And the power of God going forth through his children. And of course we see this in Matthew twenty four, in Matthew twenty four fourteen, where Jesus says, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. Kind of just showing that the gospel is is continuing, continuing conquering and conquering throughout the, the last 2,000 years. Yes. Um, so that's that's beautiful. And I think it just shows the primacy of God, the primacy of Jesus. Jesus is in control. The evil forces have lost, will lose, can never win. Uh, I think it's very helpful to keep that view that the Satan is under us. <laughs> Even though in the world it may seem that he has sort of overwhelming, some overwhelming assets, he is under us as the church and beneath us and conquered. Right. And of course, prophetic scriptures can have a number of different fulfillments. This one, I agree entirely with your interpretation. But I think also, you know, in Revelation and other prophetic chapters in the Bible, the Lord often shows the happy ending first and then goes back and tells the events that lead up to it. So here with the rider on the white horse, I think God is showing Jesus his final victory at the Battle of Armageddon when he'll lead the armies of heaven as the conquering king to conquer the Antichrist and the armies of the earth. No, it's fantastic. I love it. We'll get into it a bit later about how we look at these uh, these seals. Um, I'll, I'll tap into that a bit later as well. Should we go on to the second one? Revelation 6.3. And when he'd opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Wonderful. So pretty clear the identity of this horseman that he's represents war, uh, taking peace from the earth. So there's a couple of different ways to look at uh, this horseman. I mean, I think the, as the white horseman is Jesus, it, it's pretty clear. Some people sort of are waiting for this horseman to ride. You know, they say, oh, is the Ukraine war? Is that the, this red horse <laughs> riding? Right. Um, but I think when we have perspective, we see that the red horse has been riding for the whole of the 2000 year period, really, just with greater and greater destruction. You know, we had the First World War, 20 million died. The Second World War, the estimates are 35 to 60 million died. Gosh. So there's just been this uh, war has been consistent throughout this period. And there's actually a scripture in, in Daniel 9, 26, I believe it is, where Gabriel is telling Daniel about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And Gabriel says, wars will continue till the end. That's right. <laughs> and so it's sort of a little bit of evidence that war isn't something new, obviously, in, in the 21st century. It's actually just been a common feature of this entire period. And I think that's why Revelations is a bless has been a blessing to Christians, not just to those who believe, like we do maybe, that we're getting close to Jesus' return, but throughout history, because these have all been current things in the lives of Christians. War has been part of the life of so many places throughout the last 2,000 years. That's right. But we have here the revelation saying that war is a very important part of the last days. And of course, in Matthew 24, Jesus confirmed that by saying that there would be wars and rumors of wars, that nation would rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. It's his sort of primary, one of his primary signs of the times. 
So again, we just see that linking in nicely that uh, Matthew 24 and Revelation uh, link together in that. Simon, I just got to check that maybe for our listeners who are not familiar with the King James version of the Bible, we should explain what the four beasts are who are surrounding God's throne and summoning the horsemen to come forth. Well, it's, it's a very interesting point why it says beasts there. And it's actually a, a lovely sort of point. If we go to the Revelations 4, where it talks about God's throne, it says around the throne, there are four beasts. <laughs> you know, and this sounds to us to be like, God, why are there... Why are there beasts around God's throne? Right. And apparently, in original language, it means an animal. And apparently, some of the translators of the Bible felt it was entirely inappropriate for there to be animals around God's throne. Really? And so they changed the word to beast for some reason, which is interesting. And then someone pointed out to me that, of course, animals are very, very important in God's creation, that animals were there at the beginning with Adam, even before Adam. Animals were there with Noah in the ark. Animals were around Jesus at his birth. It shouldn't surprise us that maybe there's animals around God's throne. And actually, in the New International Version, most other translations, they translate beasts as living creatures. Living creature. Yeah, living creature. Aren't they actually cherubim angels? Yeah, who knows? I mean, it says the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So that's something to dig further into. But I quite like the teaching that God's comfortable with animals. <laughs> you know, it's not like he, you know, uh, as we see throughout the Bible. But anyway, that's a kind of a side, but an interesting point. Nightlight. What a delight. Simon, let me just interject here an important point that our listeners should understand. In the King James Version, each of the four beasts cry with loud voices, come and see. But that's actually a mistranslation because in the original text, they're simply commanded to come. So the point is that these horsemen are acting in obedience to God's orders. They're not just randomly bursting out of the scroll and wreaking uncontrolled havoc on earth. They have to operate within the confines of God's will and what they're allowed to do in order to bring about the prophesied events of the end time. Yes, I think that's a, that's quite a heavy, quite a, a deep point that you're making. But it just shows God's primacy and that we, we don't question his will. We don't question events. We trust him for bringing us through in the right way. Amen. But I, I loved what you said earlier on about, from what I said, we've seen Jesus as the first horse, war as the second horse. And we've seen that they're not like single events that happen, but they're themes that run through the entire last days period. And I quite like it. I mean, one way to look at it is they're like almost opening credits of a movie, you know, the Revelation movie starring Jesus, right. starring war. But fortunately, Jesus is the first one. So he's like the the hero who will, who will conquer in the end like in uh, all our favorite movies. That's right. And I think we see these horsemen representing the major themes, the major continuing themes, and we're going to go on to the next one, and we'll see see that one in that too. Should we go on to, to number three? And when he'd opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse... And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Thank you, Chris, for reading that. So he's got a pair of balance in his in his hand, and balances can be seen in a couple of different ways. Like some people do say, well, you know, it's, it represents justice in some way. But I think for most people, they see it as balances representing commerce. You know, you're, you're measuring out amounts of, uh, of food to be sold and, you know, money on the other side and, and things. So for most people, we see this as the power of commerce throughout the last days, the black horse, and therefore their influence on, on food and on the poor and, and on the livelihoods of people on the earth. Um, and of course, we just see how powerful that has become in the last 
five, 10, 15 years, the power of commerce to dictate things on earth. They're more powerful than countries. They're more powerful than than uh, these multinational corporations are so powerful. And of course, we're going to see it ultimately where the food supply will be restricted to those to buy and sell those who receive the mark of the beast, which will be the ultimate sort of power of this black horse. And we see like throughout history, we can see, I would say in both systems, the capitalist system, there's boom and bust and crashes and the Great Depression of the 1930s, the recent economic crashes, 1987 and 2008, kind of leading to a lot of unemployment and suffering and and poverty. Yes. But actually the sort of communist regimes were much worse when they took over control and took over the commerce of the food supply. You know, the Soviet famines, there was sort of up to 8 million died in 1930. Gosh. And the famines in China were the great leap forward of 1960 to 1962, 30 million died. Imagine. So wherever man kind of tries to control through capitalism or communism control the resources, then there's a lot of problems for poor people. And it does seem here that it means that the the price of food is high, but we're keeping the price of luxuries to be fairly cheap, the oil and the wine. I don't know. That's the general understanding of that verse. But I think it is the power of commerce. And we see that now, especially where the two horsemen, the, the red and the black, ride together with the sort of military industrial complexes which kind of sort of dictates so much of, I would say, American foreign policy these days, where war and industry is combined and commerce. Right. And of course, Jesus mentioned this, there would be famines very much in the last days as well in Matthew 24, 7. Uh, But we just do see the power of business now, businessmen calling the shots, businessmen sort of promoting this sort of uh, new world order in a way, uh, Bill Gates and uh, others incredibly powerful in this in this world and very influential. So the black horse is generally understood to be that, the power of commerce, which has always been influential. Even in Roman times, I think there were financial crashes and things and uh, problems, but uh, obviously very, very powerful now. So I go on to number five. And when he'd opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Gosh, Simon, a fourth part of the earth, and somewhere else in Revelation it speaks of a third of the population being killed. There's going to be a serious depopulation. A lot of people are going to get killed. It's quite an interesting and curious um, fraction in this thing. But yes, well, you know, if we have a any sort of nuclear exchange at any point, then, then perhaps that's why the number is so big. But yes, this is the result of the first two beasts, I think, as we see the following the war and the commerce comes death. And the principal ones are killed by the sword. And we've just seen that with the First World War and Second World War. And doubtless, perhaps some of the confrontations in the last days will lead to even greater death tolls to kill with the sword and with the hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So the beasts of the earth is curious because we, and and I think it kind of, again, probably hints to us this, the fact that these are talking about not just our little time period now, but they're actually talking about this entire period of, um, of history where these horsemen have been riding, you know. They rode out when Revelation was given, and uh, they've been riding throughout the last 2,000 years. And people used to be, you know, as a probably a common form of punishment was to be to killed, be killed by a wild beast in the sort of uh, Middle Ages. And, Interesting. You know, the, the first millennia, the first thousand years after Christ. So it's fairly clear we have that one named. That's death followed by hell, where many of the dead will go because... Uh, or Hades, whether it's a holding place or a permanent place, that's we, we've had other interviews about that. But uh, that's the following place um, where people uh, where people will go. Yeah, so it's fairly straightforward. That one's fairly clear. There's going to be a great feature of these last days. Has been a feature and will be a feature of our last days. Very sadly, and I think we can probably go on to number five. 
Revelation 6, 9 through 12. And when he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. That's right. So we see the saints, probably of all the the last 2,000 years who've been martyred, crying out, saying, well, Lord, when? When are you going to judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And they're told to wait (laughs) a little longer, because this is still our period. The Lord keeps his powder dry at the moment. He he doesn't move his hand, but we're going to see that in the next seal when he will. And this is just the the nature of increasing persecution in the last days. I read an estimate of about 160,000 martyrs a year in the 20th century. That many. And Jesus also, again in Matthew 24, we just see the same themes cropping up where Jesus clearly warned. He said, Matthew 24, 9, they will deliver you up the tribulation and kill you and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So once again, it's just nice to see them dovetail the passages and that Revelation, this part of Revelation is not saying anything particularly new. It's just sort of confirming the themes and foundations that Jesus spoke about in in Matthew 24. Um, It's just uh, very graphically illustrated, but I think it's um, it's great to know that it's very much in line with Matthew 24 and the words of Jesus. It is. And of course, the final tribulation will bring a lot of martyrdom because it says he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many was, would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So that's a great persecution uh, going on there in the last days. Um, so we just see these themes. They've been there all the time. They were there in Roman times. They were there in the Middle Ages. Been sort of particularly bad in the last century in China, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, in Africa, I think, as well. Just a lot of possibly in India as well and different places. But um, all of these uh, seals, they represent these increasingly powerful themes of the last days, the sort of starring themes in the last days movie. Uh, but the sixth seal is, is slightly different. So the sixth seal is a very key one, which I think we could go on to. Revelation six twelve through 17. And I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Wow, so this is just such an important uh, passage, the sixth seal. And we, we say it's the day of his wrath is come. What kicks off the day of his wrath is this sort of rather famous description of the, the sun becoming black, and the moon becoming red, and the stars falling from heaven. And this is just would be very familiar to the people who knew the scriptures because it appears in the Old Testament quite often, and it's always related to what's called the day of the Lord. Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And Joel 3.14 and 15, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. Yeah, I will just say, so it it seems here that the, 
it says both here that the sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will, will fall or diminish their brightness. It precedes the day of the Lord. It's the sign that precedes the day of the Lord. And we'll see it here in the next verse, Isaiah 13, 9 and 10. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I just think these verses are just very powerful. Literally the darkest hour on the history of the earth will be before the dawn of Christ's return. You know, uh, people who n- know the scriptures will just be familiar with this term, the, sun, the darkening of the sun, the moon not shining, the stars falling from heaven. And here again it says, it's, this is the day of the Lord, but it's a day of his wrath and fierce anger in that passage. And it very much lines up with Matthew 24 again, where it talks that same thing. Matthew 24, 29 talks about the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven. And it tells us when this will happen. It will happen, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. That is when we're going to have this event of the darkening of the sky. That is when the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And that is when all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the sign of the Son of Man. And they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And Jesus describes the rapture in verse 31. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So this day of the Lord is probably just the key day in the Bible, I would say, the central day of the Lord. You know, ever since they left the Garden of Eden, man has been sort of on his own and making decisions on his own by faith or not by faith. And finally, we have the intervention of the Lord, which is called in the Bible the day of the Lord. It's a day of wrath. The great day of his wrath will come. And so this is when the Lord finally releases his uh, avenging power that the the saints were calling for onto the earth. Right. And so I think it's quite interesting that many people will believe that the time of tribulation is a time when possibly when God is releasing his wrath. But it, it appears quite clear here. No, the great day of his wrath comes After, when the sun is darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall from heaven. That is the sign that his wrath is coming. And that comes after the tribulation. That's right. And so I think it's quite good to to dwell on those verses. Revelation 6.13, the sixth seal. This is the central, probably the central moment of the history of the earth, the day of the Lord. And the Lord is just a great dramatist. He just knows how to make this story, you know, uh, just the most dramatic story ever, that we will have the darkest hour coming before dawn, that Satan will appear to have won his greatest victory through the time of tribulation when he's, uh, he's given power to overcome the saints, he's given power to continue for three and a half years, and all the world will worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb. So it will seem as if, uh, to, to the worldly eyes, that the devil has won, um, but of course, as in all great stories, it's not the case. And we win through the return of Christ, and he wins through his return. Lighting your path through the end times. You're with Nightlight. Maybe I can just sort of summarize a little bit. Oh yes, please, good. Yes, please do. So we do see the sixth seal in Matthew 24. I don't know if you call it a moniker or what you call it. It's a moniker of the sun darkening, the moon not giving its light, the stars will fall from heaven, Matthew 24, 29. We see that in the sixth seal, and it represents the day of the Lord, when the Son of Man appears, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It says that he will gather his elect, that time, there'll be the rapture, but all the tribes of the earth will mourn because it's the day of his wrath. And lines up a little bit with Matthew 24, where it says that, you know, the people on the earth will not know. They will be eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage until they see Jesus coming back. Because be like the days of Noah, when they didn't repent, they didn't change, they weren't even afraid until 
the rain came and the flood came. Um, but there we go. So I, what I hope people have seen here is that, uh, you know, big picture of, of these seals is that Revelations represents not just a little period of time that we might be entering now, but represents the, the rather the entire history of the last 2,000 years. When Revelations is finished, John is told, don't seal up the book because these things are at hand. That's Revelation 22.10. Seal not the sayings of the prophecies book, for the time is at hand. And so, therefore, Revelations has been living and active through the last 2,000 years. We've seen the white horse Jesus riding. We've seen the red horse war. We've seen the black horse commerce and, and with the resulting famine. We've seen death and hell throughout the last 2,000 years and the persecution of the saints. And it just seems those are the, the main actors on the last day's stage and they're all becoming increasingly influential and powerful as we come to the sort of finale of the time, which will be the, the rise of the Antichrist and the time of tribulation. Um, but from the sixth seal, I believe it's sort of fairly clear that the day of the Lord, of his wrath and his return, it's heralded by the sun darkening, the moon will not give its light, and Jesus says that that will happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. So there's a sort of just a nice, clear link up there between Matthew 24 and Revelations, making clear they're both exactly on the same page, uh, don't contradict each other. And I think that's it for now, because that's the first six seals, so we won't go any further. Nightlight. You're listening to an international edition of Nightlight, shining God's love light to the world. And thank you so much, Simon. And if you'd like to join Simon on Telegram for a read-through of the basic Bible passages concerning the last days, starting with Matthew 24, going on into the book of Daniel, and then onto the book of Revelation, I'm including Simon's contact below. That's it for now. I'll be back again soon with another international nightlight podcast. Bye for now. This is a-